So my name is Andrew Hay. I am the Chief Information Security Officer at Data Gravity. Uh, what's funny is I've only been in that role since January 4th. And as the speakers know, um, Jennifer really pushes you hard to submit. Uh, so I was still at OpenDNS where I was the Director of Research when I came up with this idea. It's like, oh, threat hunting. I was talking a lot about DNS and threat hunting uh, from that respect. And uh, I'll submit something on this. And then I left and went to a new company. So I had to retain some of this knowledge. The great thing is that after this, I can just drink it all away because I will not need this information again in the future. Uh, I was also at Cloud Passage. That's why Rob calls me Mr. Cloud. Uh, before that, I was a dirty industry analyst at 451 Research. Uh, so I would talk to all the vendors and tell them how what they were doing was not a good idea, and they would say, oh, that's right, Andrew, and then completely ignore me. It was awesome. Yeah, wrote a bunch of books. You've not read any of them. You've heard of the products in them, but you've not read any of them. Uh, I blog fairly erratically, sporadically. Uh, and going back to the question of the Air Force and the Navy launching at the same time, it's hard to coordinate a tactical strike from the PX, Rob. So the Air Force wouldn't have gotten there before the Navy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> Hey, we have the most well-defended mall in North America. I'll have you know, we have three submarines in the West Edmonton Mall. So I'm going to talk about DNS, obviously one of the oldest protocols out there, one of the things that we take for granted. Uh, but from a threat hunting perspective, very, very useful. One of those things, kind of like PCAPs, that you wish you had after the fact. Uh, the difference is I find that DNS from a logging perspective, much easier to retain and far smaller uh, of a storage footprint after the fact. I'm gonna give you a great world, real world example that might make you think, wow, this guy's gonna screw over my company with and our printers, uh, which I may. See how many drinks I have tonight. And uh, then I'll tell you about some tools. Because this is only, this is what Rob, two hours? Two hour talk, yeah? Awesome. I've been constrained to 20 minutes. I don't know what I'm going to do. So DNS. Who here knows what DNS is? Three people? All right, cool. <laughs> so yeah, one in the back. All right, awesome. So very, very high level. And you know, don't feel bad if you're, if you're not familiar with DNS. It's just one of those things that kind of happens on the internet, like cats. Uh, DNS allows you to have a common name to type in, gives you an IP address in return to tell you how to get somewhere. Now, there's always a, there's always a lot of confusion against recursive versus authoritative DNS. Does anyone know the difference? No one. All right. So, well, because no one knows, we'll, we'll go on and I'll explain it. So recursive DNS. And I use OpenDNS because I work there and it's easier and I, I'm one of like 10 people that can remember the IP addresses. Uh, so it's really responsible providing the proper IP address. So you query something, it says, hey, I know where that is, here you go. Now if it doesn't know where that particular location is, then it'll start going out to the authoritative name servers. So it'll start checking, okay, who has .com, Okay, uh, .com, blah, 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 and all the pointers. This is how the internet works. I'm not going to, you know, this is, I think this is the first chapter of the CISP presentation. Uh, but just so you know, keep this in mind when you're thinking of how important would it be to record the information from the client computer to the websites that the client service individual file is trying to connect to. So why is, it, why is it valuable? Well, if I was still working for a DNS company, you might say, oh, because you want to sell me product. Well, no. Um, I was in research, so I couldn't sell you a damn thing even if I wanted to. I'm very big on forensic timelines. 
And I took that knowledge and applied it to network-based traffic, specifically DNS, because I want to know what happened from A to B to C to D to E to F, all the way to the end. I want to know when I'm doing an investigation, what is the scope of my investigation? I used to work at a university in Western Canada where, has anyone here ever worked in higher ed? Or still work in higher ed? Did this ever happen to you? Where you come in, I had an office, I don't know why I had an office. I came in and as I'm coming to the door, there was a guy with a pallet of workstations on their side. There's about 30 or 40 of them. And he's like, we had a, what we believe to be a child exploitation incident in the lab. Here are all the workstations from that lab. Let me know what you find. Do you have logs? No, we don't have logs, but they're, they're here. It, it's gotta be here. It was on one of these machines in this lab. Doesn't really narrow the scope. Um, not great. So same thing with DNS. Hey, something happened and there was network, networky stuff involved. Oh, do you know when it started? No. Do you know when it ended? Uh, I know when I reported it to you. Does that help? No. No. Well, I guess it's the start of a timeline. Has anyone taken any management courses, negotiation courses, um, especially negotiation ones? They always tell you to set anchors. So when you're going to negotiate for something on price, you have what in your head is the walkaway price. That'd be a good picture. Uh, and then the other person on the side of the negotiation has in their head what they're willing to walk away. Those are the anchors. So everything in between there is your negotiation price. So you have, or is your negotiable price. You have set the anchor of which this transaction may or may not occur. And the same thing applies to any sort of incident response activity because it's always good to know how far back you have to go and how far forward you have to go. Otherwise, you're going to be imaging every single machine that arrived on that pallet in the hopes of finding something. By the way, there was no information on those servers, or on those workstations on the pallet because they re-imaged re themselves every time someone logged in and logged out. So I say DNS is probably the most overlooked and undervalued asset we have from an indicator perspective, mainly because not a lot of people capture it. Uh, so these are just some of the things that when I think of what I could use DNS for, come to mind. So what domains are looked at by humans? Was there a human actually using that machine at three in the morning when that system was calling out to xyzfk9.info? Probably not, hopefully not. Why would any human ever type that in? We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, what parts of the world were they querying? Does the IP address map to that particular part of the world? Maybe, maybe not. As we know, geolocation, 100% accurate. <laughs> there was actually a story in the paper the other day about that one farm in Nebraska that everyone keeps showing up at, where it's like the geographic center of the universe, and they're getting sick of people coming by and saying, hey, what the hell? <laughs> um, all right, subsequent redirects, that's important. Again, the timeline. I went from A to B, it sent me to C, that downloaded something, actually, I'll, I'm ruining it. I won't read ahead. Uh, sometimes you'll see queries to non-existent websites, non-existent domains. That's sketchy. And I can tell you why in a bit. This is probably my fa most favorite Simpsons scene ever, where he had to, he was wearing the moo moo and walking around. Your fingers are too fat. <laughs> so domain generation algorithm. When I'm talking about the ridiculous types of domains that no human should ever type, I refer to DGAs. So it is a computer created domain that is available and has not yet been registered. So we will usually see a seed based on date, timestamp, sports team, you name it. Um, and really it allows for rapid deployment of malware without having to set up your infrastructure ahead of time. 
because if we're generating these within the application on a seed that is time, when it hits on a certain day, well, then we have another script that's just going to go register a thousand domains for the C and C. It's very cost effective. These criminals, so smart. So here's a great example from Talos. Uh, and this, which one is this? This is the Dyer. <laughs> Dyer. Dyer slash Dreza. Uh, this is how the DGA is constructed. So it's taking seeds, it's taking the date, time, creating hash, rearranging the alphabet. But what you're going to see is that Q142B3366D88 blah, 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 dot CC. Would anyone look at this and say, hey, that's probably not something someone's going to be going to or should they be going to? Uh, first indicator should be dot CC. That's that. There's certain things with regards to DNS that set off alarms. It's usually the, uh, the free domain name, uh, but also the registrant or the registrar where it's hosted or where it was registered, sorry. The problem, so if you say, oh, okay, I'm only gonna look at English language domains or commonly formatted domains. Does anyone here have a marketing team that uses Marketo? Or do you ever see these Marketo links in your email? You probably do if you've ever gone to a conference. Um, because you get these days after the fact. Like M-K-T-O-R-E-S-T, -E that's MarketoRest.com, that is a, a DGA. It's dynamically generated, or at least appears to. And then if you add the host portion, also very sketchy. You know, that looks like a computer generated, which it is, the host portion of the domain is the DGA, and then the Marketo rest part is just the easy to remember domain. Um, so yeah, this, this is totally legitimate. Well, you know, totally legitimate. In the eye of the older, right? So now redirects, like we were talking about. This is probably the most common, one of the most common exploit vectors that we see for drive-by malware. So you go to a legitimate website like CNN.com, that's not going to set off red flags. Well, it shouldn't, I suppose, because you're a Fox fan. It's, that's, a whole, that's a different war altogether. So you go to CNN.com, we've seen a lot of uh, advertising that's legitimate advertising redirecting people to fraudulent domains because it's easy. And this was called like years ago. People said, this is going to happen. Uh, Matt Johansson and Jeremiah Grossman, I believe, when they were both at White Hat, neither of which are at White Hat now, they did a presentation at Black Hat that showed this. Like, oh, look at all the money we can make or look at all the computers we can infect. So someone said, hey, you know what? I could weaponize that. That'd be great. I can make a lot more money than what they're talking about. And they did. And this is still in use because of loosely structured ad networks. So what happens is you go to CNN, the ad redirects you somewhere. So query is another domain that is sending you to a site to download something, automatically downloads, and then you execute it. Most times, or oft times, uh, it will exploit a known vulnerability. May or may not rhyme with Flash, um, or or Mud Madobe, uh, you know. And then additional payload can be delivered because that vector has been exploited, and they've got the foothold in the network. So if you're just watching at the firewall, saying, "Oh yeah, CNN.com, we allow that," or at the proxy, we allow that, the subsequent redirects. This, again, stitches together the timeline of events that you can follow. Now the fun part. Maybe. There we go. So probably, I'd say the first month, two months, when I was at OpenDNS, I started looking um, in the network of one of our customers who happened to be a Fortune 2000 oil and gas company. I was actually starting, I was trying to see uh, SCADA and ICS devices to see if they had anything calling out to the internet. 
then I saw this domain, xeroxdiscoverysupernode3.com. I thought, wait a minute, that just doesn't look right. Uh, all right, is it malware, is it phishing? Is, is this something legitimate? So then I started looking, hey, the domain's not even registered. Why would this exist? Xerox Discovery Supernode 3.com. It's not registered. Okay, so that's surprisingly fishy. And because I am a very intelligent person, as Rob introduced me, uh, I concluded that there was also Xerox Discovery Supernode 1, 2, and 3. Uh, no, 4, 5, 6, whatever. And just based on the traffic that was going just through the Open DNS network of the entire customer base, around 2,000 queries per hour. So that's a lot of queries to something that doesn't really exist. So I kept digging further. Camera guy's gonna kill me here because I keep pacing. I'm spry. All right, so I Googled the domain and I found that it was related to a Xerox Work Center printer and not like a small printer, I'm talking like a big, huge, expensive printer. And within that printer, there was a module made by McAfee. Anyone here work for McAfee slash Intel? Good, you should write this down. <laughs> because no one responded to me. So this ePolicy Orchestrator security module allows McAfee to protect these work center printers, which are essentially big ass computers, right? very fully functional, you're probably gonna to wanna to patch them, et cetera, et cetera. And like I said, not inexpensive. This is something you're gonna see at a Kinko's or you're gonna see at, what did Kinko's turn into? FedEx, thank you. Canadian, yeah. So not inexpensive. And what was happening is that these printers were beaconing out to the internet because that's where they were told to find those servers for some reason. Isn't that a great picture? So I started mapping the information and these things were querying from all over the world. Uh, apparently there's a big presence in, uh, where was it? In Alaska, yeah, lots on the East Coast, uh, South Africa. So here's the gist of what was happening. And this is based solely on doing research based off this DNS query, this domain lookup. So Xerox printers, they were querying out and in the documentation, in the McAfee documentation, I might add, uh, not the Xerox documentation, it said that if you are going to have multiple locations, you can designate one of your workstation printers to be a super node so that all of your other printers can receive their instructions from that printer. So you push uh, an update to that printer, it holds the file on its web or FTP, actually on its web server, and it allows the other printers to connect to it and download. Saving bandwidth, seems like a great idea. Now, what they didn't tell you is that neither McAfee nor Xerox registered the domains. Uh, in the documentation it says that you're supposed to register, or you're supposed to take these domains, put them into your own internal DNS, so that when your systems are trying to look up that domain, it knows where to go to that internal, non-addressable, non-routable IP. Um, so that's kind of cool. So I registered the domains. <laughs> and what this did, so I put it on a, VPS server, I was running end top. I wanted to see just how much traffic was being generated. Because before, I just knew that on the open DNS network, there were 2,000 queries per minute. So what did the world look like? So you can see here, uh, this was just a 24 hour period. We're looking at 2.65 gig just of of queries. Huh, so that's, and just so you know, it's trying to make a connection to a web server to get orders. 
I'm going to be the Skynet. <laughs> <laughs> so I sink hold them on the OpenDNS side to protect our customers um, and anyone using it free prote protected from this. I made a blog post and that, you know, I did a blog post, pat myself on the back, like everything's fixed. We're cool now. Um, I went back. This was roughly, uh, yeah, so this was just later on, uh, another, well, let's say close to 24 hours. We were already up to 240 gigs of queries. That's a lot of network traffic. The VPS provider, who said they were extremely tolerant of network connectivity and traffic rates, said that this was kind of pushing that. <laughs> like, okay, I'll take it down. So I just remapped the, uh, the domains to point to the blog post in the hopes of someone who's responding to an incident or looking at this saying, what the hell is this, will go to the blog post and say, oh, hey, that makes sense now. So we're in the home stretch, folks. Come on. All right, some tools I want to tell you about, want to tell you about from a DNS perspective. Passive total, if you're not using passive total, you should be. You know, free for individuals up to a point, uh, recently acquired by Risk IQ, so there is an enterprise version, but passive total gives you passive DNS information. Very, very cool tool. Uh, site 24-7 and DNS stuff, you can generate really a, a DNS report for a domain or use a whole bunch of tools that are hosted on their site, not on your site. So if you're doing a nation state type investigation or something where you don't want to let on that you're on to them, do it from one of those instead of your corporate network. Starbucks is also good. We do a lot of malware testing from Starbucks. <laughs> I mean, we did. <laughs> domain tools, anyone here use domain tools? Very cool. Uh, it can get a little pricey. The free tools are just as valuable. The, you know, the pay for tools, you get who, has, who in, has ever owned this domain in the history of domains, very powerful. Uh, anyone using Elk at all? Elasticsearch, Kibana, it's cool, you know what? You don't even have to know how to set it up anymore. You can do a cloud instance. You can download an OVA that has everything completely configured. You know, the bar is really low. And my recommendation, use Elk just for your DNS queries because you want to be able to rapidly search. You can compress everything. It's going to be relatively easy to keep all this information, which is very small, for a very long time. Greylog, uh, also another... <laughs> Uh, the tag of open source log management that actually works, that always kills me. I, I come from the sim and log management world, so something that just kind of works is novel. Now some of the commercial tools, again I said Risk IQ that has the enterprise version of passive total. Domain tools, again, you can get the big reports. OpenDNS Investigate would let you do some of those initial pivots like I was doing to find the uh, Xerox Discovery Supernode stuff. So this is the end. Come on. All right. Before we go, I want to give you sort of, it's just a six-step workflow. And if you take anything away from this other than how much Rob thinks of me, um, you can take away this slide. So you collect the DNS query logs. You observe network malware, someone tells you something went wrong, go back, look at your DNS records first to get a sense of what's going on. Now, if it's IP-based only connectivity, which most times malware, it's gonna use DNS because it's easier, it's lightweight, you can change the infrastructure on the back end very quickly. Uh, reference your stored DNS to really define the scope. Then start going to those third-party tools to get additional information and enrich the information as to what you're seeing, get rid of the irrelevant stuff. I don't mean to like just delete it, but you know, remove it from your investigation and then isolate the queries and the timeframes or establish the timeframes uh, based on the information that you're seeing. Hopefully that helps. 
going to break this damn thing. So DNS is one of the core protocols on the internet. How do you think you do network forensics on internet connected devices, IoT devices that are all SSL encapsulated without man in the middle them? It's hard, but a good start is looking at what they're querying. You can find out that you're, does anyone here have a Samsung smart TV at home? C connected to the internet? You know it calls Korea, right? <laughs> yeah, South Korea though, it's the good Korea, we're fine. <laughs> You're still safe. Your security clearance is still all right. <laughs> but yeah, DNS. If someone brings something into the network, you can very quickly find out if they're using a Western digital hard drive off the shelf at Costco, plugged it in. Hey, I'm seeing all these queries. What does that mean? Oh, I recognize these domains. These are Western digital storage cloud servers that it, taking all of the data on their workstation and pushing it up to their safe and secure cloud that I have no visibility into. Oh, awesome, I'm gonna go talk to that person. Like I said before, it can help you focus the investigation. It's all about timelines, setting your anchor of where to look so you're not working with a pallet of workstations. And there's a wealth of tools available. More are being developed every day. I know a lot of tools were mentioned uh, throughout today and yesterday, take a look at them. If you don't like them, change them. They're open source. That doesn't mean you get to whine about someone else's tools. It means that you have the opportunity to fix them or make them better. Yay. Unless you use Ruby, because then everyone just makes fun of you. So with that, I will break this thing. Uh, maybe. There we go, hey, hey, hey. So yeah, if you ever wanna get a hold of me, email me, hey, hey at datagravity.com, or find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm easy to find, I'll be the one making fun of Rob. Cool. Yeah. Any questions at all? Can you speak to what the proper architecture is, right? Because you see a lot of clients, um, you know, in our business where it's uncontrolled DNS resolution, right? There's no, there's no kind of choke point, there's no, you know, proper internal DNS uh, infrastructure and architecture mm -hmm. to enable uh, proper collection without adding that sensor at egress. Yeah, so I would say that following proper defense in depth mentality methodologies, uh, you should have an internal DNS server that acts as the first query point that will forward to something on your DMZ that will then perform the public lookups. And that way you have things all along the way. Uh, very easy to set up a DNS server for internal and on the DMZ. Not so simple to maintain because it's one of those things that just kind of gets, it, it's the Ron Popeil of, of server and applications. You just set it and you forget about it. Not because you want to, just because it's DNS, it'll just work. But yeah, I, I always advise going for that layered approach of having an internal DNS server forwarding to a less secure zone and then that less secure zone going out to the internet. Yes? Last, last question. <laughs> I have so, an hour and a half left, Rob. <laughs> this isn't a question, but I'm a penetration tester and I just was really excited to tell everyone to not use McAfee EPO. <laughs> That's more of a statement. <laughs> right, not a question. E EPO is a great tool if deployed properly, as many tools. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs>